Well, welcome back to another episode of Encounters with God. Uh, our guest today has had a very uh, trying experience as uh, with uh, leukemia. Has written a fantastic book, uh, Alligator Wrestling. I thought they only did this in Louisiana, but uh, <laughs> Alligator Wrestling in the Cancer Ward. Uh, we'll put a uh, link on the description so you can click on that and order his book. But uh, it's a, a pleasure to have you with us today, Kurt. Ken, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me to come on and be able to share the story. This is great stuff. Thanks. Yeah, well, um, I know the listeners are really going to... Uh, appreciate your testimony and story uh well let's just uh talk a little bit maybe before you got the uh, uh diagnosis where your life just kind of turned completely around in a in one day's time so what what was uh life like before leukemia here for kurt Okay, so so I'm a Kansas boy, if you Texans won't take too much offense at that, but I'm a Kansas boy. Grew up on a farm, uh, south central Kansas, um, and uh, it, pretty, pretty good, stable home life. Um, you know, my dad was World War II, U.S. Navy, had uh, two older brothers. Uh, my dad always told my brothers and me that the man belongs in church on Sunday morning. And so when I got to my rebellious teenage years, it did not occur to me to rebel against that one, because after all, a man belongs in church on Sunday morning. So we grew up that way. Uh, I ended up going to college after I got out of high school uh, through a series of encounters in college. Uh, was when I was first exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way that connected with me. Maybe I'd heard it before, but it never really took root. That happens. It's pretty common, I think. So I gave my life to uh, Jesus about the time I was about 17 years old, almost 18, when I was a freshman in college. Um, so that was that pretty well helped define my future course for a few years with that. Um, so I was involved in, in that sort of thing. When I got out, I uh, went to work eventually for Southwestern Bell Telephone Company, major communications company. In fact, I sent out I think I sent out 20 resumes in Kansas City, and I only had one of them that responded. They tore up the resume and called me back and said, and said if you're interested, here's the number for the employment office. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got a job. The first one that asked me to dance, I danced with. And I spent uh, 36 years uh, with that organization, ended up as a, uh, as a national sales manager in the 911 public safety arena. Uh, during that time, I was married. We have uh, two boys who are both adopted. They're both uh, 30-somethings now, um, and both gainfully employed in the private sector, although they both came through a U.S. Army. One was ROTC out of K-State. Uh, the other went to college and got two degrees and decided to enlist, uh, which flabbergasted his, his recruitment officer, <laughs> but he decided to do that. Then he was eventually discharged, and he's, uh, he's a police officer in Texas now, in a, in a municipality in Texas. So that's kind of our contribution to the Texas thing. So I, I retired a few years ago, and I dabbled in a, in a few other things. And then I went back to work for a friend of mine as a, as a sales rep traveling in a small business uh, in Wichita. And uh, that's when the story picks up with the visit to the doctor uh, with, with a routine wellness check and the leukemia set in. Yeah, so you were just going in. It's like a yearly physical. You were just going in. You, you felt fine, right? You you were doing good. You're relatively healthy. Yeah, I I had a few symptoms, but you know I'm a farm kid. You got bruises, fine. Suck it up. Get 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 over it. It'll be fine. Uh, you've got a recurring canker sore. It, it's okay. It'll go away after a few weeks, probably. So uh, and I, and I didn't realize what the symptoms meant. You know, I do now. Uh, I, I found myself, I, I, I do some work outside. I work firewood a little bit. And uh, on the first really hot day we had in 2022, two years ago, I was working at my firewood lot. I was cutting up fist-sized chunks for smoking and grilling stuff for sale to wholesalers, wholesale sale. So I was cutting that up and it was the first really hot, humid day we had here in Kansas, a little bit of breeze. I was working in the shade, not working strenuously, DeWalt, chop saw, cutting up fist-sized chunks of pecan or something. And in 30 minutes, I found that I was sitting on a bucket in the garage with a fan on me and I was sweating like a horse and I was completely out of breath. And I thought, this isn't normal. I mean, I, I should be fine. I know it's a humid day, but I should be fine. And like most of us, Ken, I'm thinking, 
probably it's it's some heart problem, right? Some heart attack thing probably coming on. Do I have time to finish this load of firewood before I have to go take care of this? <laughs> so, so I, but I made my way home after a while. And, and as it happened about two days after that, I had a routine annual wellness check scheduled with my family physician. Usually I blow those off because why would a healthy guy like me need a routine annual wellness check? But because of that, I went in and saw him. They drew blood. Uh, I went on to work at my job as a sales rep. And then three hours after uh, I left the doctor's office, the nurse called, said, uh, Mr. Gormley, your blood levels are way off. Maybe there's a problem with the measurement. Could you please go to an emergency room and have the blood test repeated? I thought, well, well, fine. I thought, you know, I came to work late this morning because of the doctor's visit. And so now this is going to take my lunch hour. And if this goes too long, I will be obligated I'll take some vacation time. I hate wasting vacation time. <laughs> so I went to the ER and in, in 20 minutes, they had me on my back in bed with, a, with an IV set up and some goop gripping into my arm. And, and then the doctor came in and started talking to me. So that's kind of how that started. They were concerned about your platelets. Platelets uh, were way low. Uh, when the nurse called. Oh, was it four or something? Four. Yeah, yeah. four. <laughs> Yeah, the nurse called and said, and I had no idea what a platelet is. I heard it once in seventh grade science class, I think. Yeah. You know, I don't know. And she says, they're supposed to be at 150, and they're at four. Um, I said, that doesn't four sound what? good. I said, for what? <laughs> I mean, I got four of them, right? I mean, how many do you want? And she, she said, it doesn't make any difference what it's supposed to be, but it's wrong. <laughs> Go, I don't want to argue about it. Go to the doctor. <laughs> Go to the ER and get the test repeated. And actually, by the time I got there, they were down to two. That was only a few hours after this. And, and that, that is, by the way, thousands. It's supposed to be 150,000 of these things in your system. And you only have 4,000 or down to 2,000. And the platelets carry, um, it's red blood cells. You know, they carry oxygen uh, to the rest of the body. And so the shortness of breath that I had experienced from two days previous was related to that. So it's, it's, and I actually don't know the difference in all that stuff. I'm just a layman, but it's platelets, it's red blood cells, it's white blood cells. Uh, those three things. And when that doctor came into the ER and he sits down on his, on his rolling stool and he says, he says, you know, there's a difference between lymphoma and leukemia. And I'm glad you came in when you did. And, and, I, and, I, and, you know, I'm still thinking about all the email I've got at work that I've got to answer. You know, I've got, I've got sales proposals out. I've got orders for stuff. <laughs> and I say, why are we talking about the L words? What, what is, I don't even know what those are. What does it mean? <laughs> and he says, well, he says, you've got low platelets, low reds and low whites, and that's a strong indication of leukemia. And I said, is that a diagnosis? And he said, of course not. We're in ER. We're not qualified to diagnose that. He says, but I'll tell you, I've been to med school. And if you got low platelets and low whites and low reds, brother, you've got leukemia. <laughs> so he called the meat wagon. He called the ambulance and, and I was transported to a local hospital in Wichita that afternoon. And I didn't walk out for 83 days. <laughs> yeah. And they, they gave you a, a pretty grim diagnosis there. You, you, you thought you had you maybe, you know, 10, 10 years, 15 or 20 years. And I, I think they told you you got two weeks. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I, I see the oncologist the next morning. He's a Lebanese guy. I really like him. He's very aggressive. Um, I mean, in, in, a, in a good sense of, of treating the, the malady. And he says, uh, he says, you know, you've got this collateral issue. You got some swelling, you got some kind of infection, you got the bruising, you got this stuff going on. He says, what we wanted to do is put you on antibiotics for two weeks. And then we're going to start chemotherapy for the leukemia. But I want to go and study a couple of reports first, and I'll come back and report to you. So he leaves the room. And in two hours, he comes back and says, I think... I think I've changed my mind. He says, you actually do not have two weeks. <laughs> so we're going to start leukemia immediately, like tomorrow morning. And I say, fine, except Ken, we didn't. Because when you do, when you do the chemotherapy, uh, there's a cocktail that they brew, right? And they brew that locally in the hospital. It has a certain very short shelf life. And they've got to brew the cocktail based on the patient's diagnosis and based on the condition. And one of the things you have to do to brew the cocktail is do the EKG and see, is this, going, is this particular brew going to damage anything around the heart? 
and there's a lot more detail to it than that. But that means you've got to have an EKG and you've got to have a cardiologist interpret the EKG and he's got to review the case and he's got to know a lot about it. Well, that takes time to do. And besides that, the facility in that hospital who, who makes up that special cocktail was offline for remodeling. So they can't mix the cocktail locally. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get any sheetrock dust in it, please. So they had to, so they had to send the order to another hospital, a, a sister group across town, which isn't bad. Which it does not that big. So they had to get somebody else to do it. Except that the the, the brew machine people only work from four a.m. to four p.m. Probably because they come in early to get it mixed up and get started. So the order, once the EKG thing got done and the cardiologist got done ruminating on this and, and said, yeah, okay, this will be how we're going to do this. The order got to the, to the brew making people at something like 4.15 that afternoon. So we ran another day off the clock because they can't start till tomorrow morning. <laughs> so we lost two days initially. And of course, I'm laying there thinking, I thought he said something about 14 days. It seemed fairly important at the time. <laughs> I could hear, I, I could, I could see the sand running through the hourglass as, <laughs> as we lay there watching Bonanza on TV in the hospital room. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but we got that, that brew started. And I got to say that the, the help there at the hospital is just outstanding. It's, uh, what was going through your mind? I mean, you know, you're, you're, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of people have confronted different things, but, this is totally off the, this, this is not on the radar here. <laughs> it is clear uh, out of left what, field. What was going through your mind and what were you thinking theologically or mentally or spiritually about this whole thing? And I think you decided to call Lynn and thought, you know, my, maybe call yeah. the wife here about this. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I did think to call her when I was at the ER before I ever got put to the real hospital. And I thought I really should call her. <laughs> <laughs> if anything goes wrong, she's going to say, what are you doing there? <laughs> so I called her and said, I'm at the ER. They want to repeat the blood test. No problem. And then she called me two hours later when I was still at the ER, just before I got on the ambulance. She says, I suppose you went back to work, right? And I said, actually, <laughs> there are a few details we should probably cover. <laughs> but, but no, I didn't. And by the way, um, I left my pickup in the South parking lot. If you wouldn't mind getting your brother to come along and drive it home for me, that would be a plus. So, but your question about the, the theological contemplations is really a good one. Ken's very insightful because when I was laying there in that hospital bed, um, fear began to creep in because I don't know what the future holds. I don't like pain. I don't like discomfort. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm as wimpy as the next guy is. I don't like that stuff. I don't like the discomfort. And shoot, just and, and I know from from experience and what my dad has told me, he he had he had a heart attack ten years before he ever died from a heart attack. Spent some time in the hospital. Just laying in a hospital bed, immobile for a couple of weeks, will will destroy your physical capability, particularly as we get older. I've got to get up and I got to keep moving, otherwise I'm going to stay here forever. So so fear crouched at the door, and and I thought, you know. I can't tolerate that. That fear is going to eat my lunch because it's going to destroy my attitude. And I'm, you can probably tell I'm normally a very outgoing guy, dark humor, gallows humor, kind of a specialty here, <laughs> but, but I could not tolerate the idea of the fear of being there. And so I came to a resolution when I was laying in the hospital bed by myself, I thought, you know what? I am the toughest hombre that has ever been in this cancer ward. I am tougher than any six people you can name. I am, I am John Wayne. I think I put in the book, I am John Wayne. I am Sylvester Stallone. I'm Dave Bautista. I'm Chuck Norris. I'm all rolled into one. I can do anything you want me to do. Any pain, any discomfort, any irregularity. I, I will chew it up and spit it back at you. Um, and I decided I'm going to be a tough guy. Now, the nurses just roll their eyes. Hey, tough guy, time for your shot. Ow, that hurts. Uh, so they roll their eyes. And family and friends make fun of me for that. That's fine. Why did I come to that conclusion, Ken? And I, and I, I had to think, I had to process this for a few weeks. But I realized I came to that conclusion because I'm going to adopt that persona. Because what's on the other side is the fear. 
that's going to come in and take over. And it makes me, it makes me think, what will happen to me next? And I cannot abide that uncertainty or that, that, that shrinking, cowering timidity of, of what will happen to me next. And that relates to some of the things that I put in the book about that passage in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, which was very clear to me at the time. Yeah, that's so good. You know, yeah, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And, you yeah. know, as a, as a man, think it's so easy. Uh, and Vata yeah, Proverbs, right. and so, yeah, those that's, are yeah. people, you that's see it. people that um, have the mindset, you know, I've heard it expressed before, well, he just gave up, he got yeah. tired, he got tired of fighting, you know, those yeah. type of expressions, and I think when you, you know, I mean, some people, it could be God's time to take them, uh, but Right. It may well be. Right. Yeah, it very well could be. But some but on the other hand, I think if you don't have that fighting attitude or uh, I think you've got a couple of strikes against you from the get go. Maybe maybe it's just quality of life. Maybe that's what it is. You know, he may take me in his time. And, you know, these blood cancers, these blood cancers recur. I talked to the oncologist probably what a week ago, two weeks ago, and he said, usually. Blood cancers recur two years after you're in remission. Well, fine. I've been in remission for six months now, so the clock's running, right? <laughs> Except this one may be different. He says, you know, but, but your numbers don't, and currently your numbers don't match up with our historical expectation of acute myeloid leukemia. I have this, I won the lottery count. I've got this rare variant that's called FLT3, F-L-T-3. I don't know what it stands for, and I probably couldn't pronounce it, but it it is a it is a genetically mutated white blood cell. So this genetic mutation, the white blood cell is hatched in the bone marrow where they come from, and it grows halfway up. It remains juvenile all its life. All it does is consume resources, and it crowds out other white other healthy white blood cell, and it never does what it's supposed to do. I've I, when I've spoken in churches, I've said this is sort of like a teenager that you might know. <laughs> who's still living in the basement when he should have moved out. He's consuming resources and never getting a job. So these, so this, these flit three white blood cells have taken over, but it's very rare. I asked one of the nurses at the hospital about it. This is a cancer center. Who's one of the premier places in this area of, of, of uh, Kansas. She said, you know, we had a patient like this uh, two years ago in here. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's the most recent one they had with the same, variant so that's that's that translates to about half of one percent of the of the cancer population maybe maybe one percent so so the doctor told me a couple of weeks ago he says you're you are responding to this new medication the fda just approved it about five years before my diagnosis so it's new there are no longitudinal studies on it he says he says you're you're performing in ways much better than we would have expected so we're in hopes that that medication has really closed the door on that flip three variant. So we'll see how that works. I don't know. You know. One never knows what a day may bring forth. It doesn't. Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward, said Job. <laughs> That's what Job said. <laughs> so when so when I was when I was laying there in the in that hospital bed that first couple of nights, um, I was I was thinking about the fear and just unbidden to me came this phrase for God has not given us a spirit of timidity. And I wasn't thinking about that. It's 2 Timothy 1.7. I've, 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 I've practiced scripture memory really all my life. Since I first was, uh, came to Christ when I was 17, I've, I've engaged in a, in a process of scripture memorization. I use the navigators, uh, nav presses, uh, you know, the, topical, the new topical memory system. Uh, and I've done other things as well with that. But that came to me unbidden. God has not given us a spirit of timidity. And I was arguing with the Lord, so what? I can be timid or not, so what? Um, this thing may get me. And then it comes back to me. God has not given us a spirit of timidity. And then the rest of the phrase, but of power and love and discipline. And, and I began to, th and the more I thought about that, the more I thought about it, it kept coming back to me. And I, and I realized there's something there for me with the fear that's crouching at the door there is something there for me to be able to fight that. Uh, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the way he fought the devil was by quoting scripture to him. 
man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. And there are two other passages like that as well. He quotes scripture. <laughs> I had, I, I helped with a high school youth group at our church about, I don't know, it's probably been 20 years ago now, when the, um, the, the little rubber bracelets were popular, uh, you know, the live strong bra bracelets and that kind of stuff. So I made little rubber bracelets for the kids who had memorized a certain number of verses. I made little rubber bracelets that were camouflage in color with an embossed orange lettering that says uh, um, JWQS on the bracelets. Jesus would quote scripture. <laughs> Instead of instead of the WWJD, what would Jesus do? Ours was Jesus would quote scripture. <laughs> yeah, that's a good but, one. But that came back to me in the hospital. And so that's where that that thing came from. I, I've thought of the power and love and discipline as, you know, the 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 discipline part is is be disciplined enough to recognize the reality of what's on the ground in front of you, what's the reality of your situation, and have the courage to rise toward that, toward that and to, to have victory over that situation. Even though you might die, even though it might come to a bad end, let's be victorious on the way there. Uh, and let's trust in the, in the leading of the Holy Spirit to make us victorious in our circumstance. Yeah. Well, it seemed like as, as I was reading your book to uh, your attitude, you know, I think you said, it, you know, if you got the, if you lose the attitude war, you lose the war was your quote. Right. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. But man, I, I kind of start feeling sorry for you. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, okay, that he's got a diagnosis here two weeks and they're going to treat him for this uh, leukemia, this AML. And that, man, just one thing after another, I thought, wow, this, this guy's like a modern day Job. So you, you get in there and they're trying to treat you and you get mouth sores right out of the bat. Uh, <laughs> that was a trip. <laughs> and I mean, just, and then. I mean, maybe talk to that. <laughs> that's a fun, that's really a fun part of the story. Again, <laughs> Mouth sores are not uncommon for cancer patients. Um, anybody with cancer has had, uh, maybe you've, maybe you've experienced that, but, but the mouth sore, the cancer sore, uh, you know, I thought it was, a, I was on a water pill for some of the swelling a doctor had prescribed before I ever got this diagnosis. And, and I thought it was, I was allergic to the water pill, but I wasn't. But man, there was a black spot inside my cheek. And the next day it would move to the other side. Uh, and eventually there was a blemish on the right side of my tongue about halfway back. And it was so bad when I was in the hospital now. It got so bad I couldn't swallow. Uh, I, I drooled when I talked. Some have said the only thing I do very well is speak. I don't know why they get that idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's about all I got going for me. And but it's just, it's just debilitating. So I was there for after 10 days in the hospital and I'm supposed to be there for 30 days about. So after the first 10 days, this thing is so bad that the nurse and I had worked out a regimen two hours before I ate, she would give me an oxycodone pill. And then one hour before she'd give me an extra strength Tylenol. And then when the dinner showed up, I would swab the inside of my mouth with lidocaine just to deaden everything. And then I could choke down a few bites of food. You got to eat, right? That's the way we're going to do it. You got to eat. So that's what I was doing. And then Marva, the, the housekeeper, Marva, she's six feet tall. She's very black. She has, she has a personality that sucks up all the oxygen in the room. <laughs> She is a delight. She has become one of my good friends. She walks into the room, never having met me. And she says, here, I am here to clean the room for Mr. Kurt. Would that be you? <laughs> and, and through this mouth, so I tried to explain it. I, me, I, and she, she says, what you looking so down for? Do you not know this is the day the Lord hath made? <laughs> and her voice is booming. And, and so I explained the mouth. So my wife's there with me. I explained the mouth sore to her. And she says, Mr. Kurt, Jesus do not want you suffering from no mouth sore. We're going to pray against that mouth sore right now. <laughs> and she came over to the bed, leaned her mop up against the wall, comes over to the bed. There's a, there was a girl with her, another black girl who was uh, a smaller version of Marva. And, and her assistant got down on her knees and closed her eyes and raised her hand in prayer. And Marva came over and laid her hands on me. And this is no genteel... Oh, dear Jesus, we just thank you for this boy and ask him. <laughs> no, <laughs> we stormed the gates of heaven. 
<laughs> and she took Lynn and me along for the ride. And I think she goes on for five minutes in this, in this, what I presume is this, this Pentecostal like prayer, you know, from, from her church and background, you know, and she said, Lord, Lord Jesus, you made this man's mouth and you can cure this man's mouth. We ask you right now, Lord, right now to fix this man's mouth so that he can breathe and he can swallow and he can eat and he can testify to the glories of God because, of, you know, so we go on for this goes on five minutes, you know, at the end of this, and this is a Saturday, and I am thoroughly exhausted at the end of the five minutes. I mean, I'm just emotionally drained when she's done. And she, so she finally says, amen. And, and I try to say thank you. And all I can do is squeak out, thank you, which is a little embarrassing for a tough guy like me. So, and then she cleaned the room, take out, take, you know, they take out the trash, mop the floor. I'll be back and look in on you in a few days. So, Ken, the next morning, there is no more mouth sore. It's gone. <laughs> now, the blemish is there, and I can feel it. And over the course of the next four or five days, the diminish completely goes away. There's no difficulty. I mean, after the first, after maybe 24 hours, there's no difficulty in swallowing. We finally get rid of the oxycodone. Don't need that. Or the lidocaine or the Tylenol. And I asked one of the doctors, what's up with that? And he says, yeah, you know, sometimes that happens. <laughs> You know, he says, uh, he says, you know, we, and I, I understand from a chaplain friend of mine that they call that um, spontaneous remission. There, there's a, it's a semi-technical clinical term for it, which, which I have a lot of respect for. It allows the doctor to acknowledge that there are things outside our control or his control uh, that will happen to us and yet not have to engage in a theological conversation about it. You know, he doesn't have to immerse himself in that in that uh, one side against the other side of, is it a miracle? Was it a healing? Was it not? He can just say it's spontaneous remission. Sometimes it happens. So anyway, that was more of That wasn't the last time role that she played with me, but that was the first time I met her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, m maybe this will be a good time I, I, to interject. Uh, I didn't, I'd never heard of it before. What's, what's caring bridge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Caringbridge.org. Caring bridge is all one word and it's, it's a website uh, it's a social media website, kind of like Facebook, uh, but it is intended, and it's it's actually free to the user, but it's intended for people who are hospitalized or have some medical condition that they want to tell people about, so that it keeps people, it, it kept me from getting 50 text messages a day saying, so Kurt, how are you doing? Uh, the answer, of course, would be, I have a terminal disease and I don't think I'll last the summer. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> times 50 yeah 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 if times 50 and the last thing i feel like doing is typing on my phone right now <laughs> with my thumbs <laughs> so that's caring bridge and i was familiar with it from some other people i had known now, i don't know how widespread i think it's nationwide but i don't really know uh it's free to the user and the way they are supported is people who who log on to it to to assess your condition to hear about it they are free to make a, a monetary contribution i think the it's like a $15 or $25 minimum that they, that they want. But, uh, but I, by the time I was done with that, after three months, I had 228 followers on caring bridge who were reading my stuff every day. And I think about probably 10% of those had contributed financially. So, you know, so they've got a couple hundred dollars, three or four hundred dollars they made on me uh, out of that thing. So, but it's a great thing. And it let people know, you could update people and let them know oh, yeah. how to pray for you. Uh, exactly. That was a big part of. Uh, it was enormous. Responses enormous. and. Yeah. 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 And one of the, one of the things is I, I determined if I was going to do that, I determined I'm going to write every day that I'm in the hospital. I'm going to write a little blurb of something because I want to keep them engaged. Uh, I needed the prayer and I knew that, you know, early on for the first probably for the first two weeks, I thought, I'm probably not going to survive this. And the doctor said two weeks to live. And then he said, you should probably know that for most patients who come to me with numbers like yours, do not survive to walk out. So I don't know why he said that, but I appreciated it because it's brutally honest uh, and it sets my expectation. And it also has a way of focusing me entirely on what his advice is. <laughs> <laughs> let's be cooperating with whatever they want to do here because he's the guy who probably knows. But I determined to post every day uh, that I was in the hospital and I did. And I wanted the post to be upbeat, 
optimistic in the sense of, gee, this really stinks, but look, at least dinner was good. You know, some 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 levity in it, some some, uh, and not not a Pollyannish thing. And I never said I'm going to beat this thing because, frankly, we never know if we're going to beat it or not. That's not our deal. That's God's deal. I don't know if I'm going to get out of it or not, and I still may not. Who knows? But I wanted to post every day because I wanted to keep what I thought of as my posse engaged. I wanted them. So I so I said to this this guy who owns a small business that I work for. You know, I'm part time back there. When I got out, I said, I know that that your heart sank every morning about nine or 10 o'clock when I'd make a post and your phone blips that says Kurt just made a new post on Curing Bridge because you got 50 employees here and all over the company phones are blipping and you're thinking, oh, great. There's 20 minutes of lost productivity. Well, everybody checks Kurt's post for today and then they got to talk about it. <laughs> and he said, yeah, couldn't you wait till five o'clock to do that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was Curing Bridge. Yeah, that's great that there's a, a platform like that. I'm, I will put yeah. a link on that as well. And yeah, do that. It's, it's it's really useful. Yeah, very helpful. So the mouse sores, and then it then it was your chills, amphoteras, and they call it ampho. The nurses call it ampho terrible. Uh, it's it's awful. And they said, you know, the the doctor says, and I don't, you know. My wife remembers this stuff. I don't remember why it was exactly they administered this antibiotic to me, but there was something going on that I needed this, this, this drug for amphoterism and, and the and it's an injection. And the doctor said there are a few patients who sometimes report some mild discomfort with a little bit of chills. <laughs> so little alarm bells should go off with that kind of qualification for it. So so the first night I I don't know, first night or second night or something. I think first night I take this thing. And, you know, after an hour, I thought, that wasn't bad. I'm fine in an hour. Well, <laughs> you know, at the second hour, somebody flipped the switch. And and I'll tell you what, I'm in, I'm in the middle of Kansas. But I, I had the impression that the Arctic wind came out of the Wind River Canyon and swept through my room. And it was 50 degrees below zero. <laughs> and I had, now, this isn't true, but I had the impression that the windows are rattling. There are books falling off the wall. The bed is shaking. I know the bed was shaking because I was chilled so badly. I was unbelievably cold. And I fumbled. My hands are shaking. And, my teeth are shaking, and I fumbled for the nurse call button. And they were expecting my call. So they come in with warm blankets. You know, they're warmed up in the oven. So so they put four or five warm blankets on me. That's still not enough, but it's a nice gesture. So so they do this thing, and, and I lay there with these unbelievable chills. And this lasts for maybe two hours, three hours. I mean, it just seemed like it's all night. Uh, and then, and I guess there's a fever. The fever breaks. The chills are gone. The bed sheets are drenched with sweat. You know, and finally, I throw off the blankets and think, oh, my gosh, I hope that never happens again. <laughs> But it did. <laughs> Every night it's like this. And so I put it on Caring Bridge. And I say, we've got we've got some mild case of chills that feel like somebody left the north door open to, to Alaska or to Canada. And and I know that there are people who prayed for that because I asked them specifically in Caring Bridge, please lift that up. And by the third night, there's no more chills. Uh, they're, they're gone. We got the blankets. We're all ready. The nurses, you know, I know who's on the shift. I know the CNA. She's here. She's ready with the warm blankets. Uh, they bring the warm blankets to me. I put them on and I'm sweating like a horse. I can't do this. So I throw the blankets off. I put a light sheet on and I sleep through the night very peaceably and did that for the rest of that 10 day regimen. Hmm. Of that particular prayer prayer worked again. Prayer worked again. Yeah. And I, you know, is it a miracle? I don't know. How would you draw the line? How would you say it's a miracle? But, but it worked, you know, it's, it's not, this is it a miracle or not? This is not a lab experiment. This is real life. Uh, so, so if we can pray, let's pray. And that's uh, anyway. That's 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 the whole thing about keeping the posse engaged. I need their prayer. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it's kind of like a, with the carrying bridge. It made me think of like Moses holding up the yeah. rod, and he had Aaron and her. You know, Aaron and her holding him up. You know, and so you know. I think you get into it later about bearing one another's burdens, but that's exactly right. Yeah. But then, uh, you, you're not out of the woods yet. The next thing you focus on, you got a lung fungus. <laughs> we're, we're barely started. <laughs> yeah, we are. I mean, I, you know, I've got this list here. I'm thinking, man, 
you know, the Grim Reaper's <laughs> coming for you, brother. <laughs> I can hear him in the hallway. Click, click, click. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that fungus, uh, what do we call that? Uh, f f fusarium, f fusarium, F-U-S-A-R, fusarium. So, and my wife noticed this, you know, I was up, sat up in bed doing something and she said, there's a couple of, and I don't know how I put this in the book. She said, there are a couple of new red spots on his back. She tells the nurse, take a look at those. And the nurse looks at those as well. A couple of blemishes on his shoulder. I don't know what that is. I'll ask the doctor about it. So when the doctor comes in and this is, you know, I've got, I had 38 different doctors in all, by the way, in five different disciplines. So I don't know who came in. One of the doctors says, yeah, that looks like, looks like an infection of some kind. We'll get the, uh, the infectious disease specialist to look at it. Well, by the time she looks at it, you know, an hour later, there's four or five red spots on my back. I thought there were only two. No, there's five, really. And there's one on your scalp. And by that afternoon, there's another dozen all over me. And it looks like smallpox. I mean, what, what is this stuff? So they do a biopsy. Easy to say. Cha-chunk. Ow. <laughs> Good thing I'm a tough guy or that would really have hurt. <laughs> so they send this off to, I think, the Mayo Clinic. And they get it back the next day. And it's a, it's, it's a blood-borne fungus, uh, which means it's not like any self-respecting athlete's foot. Uh, this is in the blood system. So we can go any place, as I say in the book, like the Holy Spirit, it goeth whither it willeth. Uh, <laughs> and we don't know where it's going to land. You know, I had one of those little blemishes that landed between toes two and three of my left foot, all the way down in, in, the, in, in, the, in the V, all the way down the wedgie, where, where it will never get light or air. And that stayed there for weeks. I mean, after, after everything's over, uh, after the fungus is gone or or at least pushed away, that sore is still there. You know, and we've got nurses treating the foot. You know, we're putting neosporin on it and put cotton balls in there to get air to it. And it's just awful. So so that thing showed up. Uh, so they're treating that with, I don't know, maybe that's what the amphotere is in for. I don't remember, but but they're treating that with, with some kind of stuff. And that was supposed to be that. Uh, and it was until it wasn't. <laughs> so... I don't know if you want me to keep going on this or not, but yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. It's... so yeah, we're, we're not, we haven't got to the juicy part yet. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. yeah so... I mean, <laughs> you know, next thing you go, you've gained 43 pounds just about like overnight. Oh, for heaven's sake. Fluid all and... those, all that fluid. And it's all in my, it's all in my legs. I can't get my legs out of bed without, without a, a, a CNA, a nurse assistant helping me with that. I mean, this is ignominious. Okay, I can't lift my legs out of bed. I can't even roll out of bed. So, yeah, I gained 43 pounds in three days. Uh, and it's, it's because of all the IVs that they're pumping into me. And, you know, and you realize sometime that stuff's got to go away. I mean, you got to get rid of that fluid sometime. And this is, you're, you're not going to get rid of it in three days. That's got to be a long, a long process. In fact, I've still got some very minor swelling in my right foot uh, that's left over from that. That's been two years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm treating that and, you know, we're, we'll be okay, but, but it's a little bit of residual. So I'm there for, I think in 34 days, you know, I've, I've been in for 34 days and what you're supposed to do is it, with chemotherapy, you've got, um, uh, they call this a seven, three treatment. Um, there's seven days of treatment, uh, all seven days, you get a particular chemo drug, drug a, and for three days you get drug B, but they're concurrent. So the first three days you have both A and B, and then the next four days you just have A. And one of those, the one that's three days long, is, is very hostile to your system. Um, it's it's bright red. They administer it in a in a like a hypodermic needle that's about an inch in diameter and eight inches long, and they stuff the thing into your to this port that takes it into my veins. Uh, a nurse has to manually push that stuff in there. It takes her something like half hour to get that administered into the system or something like that. A friend of mine says, that looks just like the red lithium grease that I used on my 66 Chevy in the ball joints. <laughs> and the grease gun looks the same, <laughs> not the same consistency. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so they administer this stuff. So that, that whole thing lasts for a week. And that's what people talk about on, on why chemotherapy is so ugly because you get real sick with that. 
And I, you know, I, I did fine for a couple of days. My wife asked the nurse, when's he going to get sick? And she said, oh, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the next day I, I hit the wall the next day. So there's, I mean, there's nausea, there's vomiting, there's diarrhea, there's temperature, there's general ache and pain. It feels like the flu on steroids. I mean, it's just awful. No appetite, but you still got to eat. I got tubes all over, so you, you can't get out of bed. It's just, yeah. So, so that's the, that's the induction phase of chemotherapy, which lasted a period of time. And the, and the ache and stuff lasted for maybe a week after that. So your body's real weak and you got to recover from that. And while you're recovering, your white blood cell count is crashing down through the floor. Because what the point is, is to kill off all those white blood cells, because some of them are bad guys. And then you let the bone marrow recreate white blood cells. And that takes a couple of weeks for them to recreate. And you hope that the bad ones don't come back in the recreation. And as you do that iteratively over a number of, of months, then eventually you will purge out the system of, of the bone marrow's capability to manufacture those bad mutated white blood cells. That's what, that's the point of it. So it has to, it has to happen over and over again. So you do the first induction week while you're inpatient in the hospital. And then after 30 days, you're fairly well recovered from that. Well, you're going to start chemo again. Now the consolidation phase starts one week out of every month. You're going to start that next week. So they're going to send me home after 30 days and then bring me back a week later for one week and then send me home for three weeks and then bring me back for a week. So that's how that's going to work. It didn't work out that way for you. Not precisely. So after, so after 34 days, you know, on the mouth sores deal and the ampho terrible and the chills and, and the lung fungus and all this stuff. Okay. That's all maybe behind me and, and I feel better. So I'm going to go home. So, so on a Sunday night, I'm ready to go home. Um, as it now, and, and something that's true of most hospitals across the country now in the wake of COVID is they don't have adequate help in the nursing staff. They can't, they can't get nurses. I think in this particular facility I was at, they have 40 beds in the cancer unit and only two dozen of them are occupied because they just don't have the staff to have a full boat of a patient load there. So, so that, and they're supposed to have three or four patients each per, per nurse. So that last night I'm there, one nurse who's supposed to be on duty failed to show up for work. He, he called in. He said, hey, man, I'm really sorry. I forgot I'm on a fishing trip. I forgot this is my weekend. I can't make it back there. Okay, fine. So they've got to take some of us guys and redistribute us among the remaining nursing staff who are already overworked. So there's one girl there who is 24 years old. She was a nurse when I first checked in. I met her. She was great with child. I met her one day and then she left to go have her baby. And 30 days later, she comes back off maternity leave. And lo and behold, I'm still there. This is my last night in. It's her first night back. She's young. She's not really inexperienced, but she's young. She's getting reacclimated to this. And they say, well, give Kurt to Kristen. She can take care of him because she's getting reacclimated and he's not going to need any help because it's his last night in. Right. <laughs> so at nine o'clock that night, I get ready for bed. I'm up and mobile. I get ready for bed. I sit down on the edge of the bed and suddenly all the stars in heaven fell out of the sky and they came down to earth and they all landed in my chest and they're all made out of broken glass. They grate against each other. I can't breathe. I can't swallow. I can't move. I can't sit up. I can't lie down. There's this horrible rasping pain all over from, from, from neck to belt line all over. I'm jammed with something gas or something. So I learned later what this is. It's blood that escapes the vascular system. I had a ruptured spleen. Once the spleen turned loose, the blood gets out where it doesn't belong. And a doctor told me later that when the blood is loose outside the system, it, it produces very raspy, sharp anguish of whatever it touches. And because your brain cannot localize the pain in your abdomen, it thinks it's coming from every place. Yeah. So it's, it's not like pain's right here because it can't localize that. It just comes from right here. So, so that explained what happened, but that, that fusarium fungus that was bloodborne that we pushed away, it was still doing its work and it attacked the spleen, which, which, which is supposed to 
purify impurities from the system. And it lets things go on through. And if they're to be eliminated, they go to the bladder. And if they re return to the cell, it's magic. They go back into the vascular system. Magic. It's the way God made it. So, so, um, and it's remarkable. It is absolutely. Anyway. Uh, Fearfully they, and wonderfully uh, made. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Kristen is looking at me. I'm laying in bed and I'm curled up in a fetal position. And I report my pain is something like 10 on a scale of one to 10. And she's, and two months later, she and I debriefed this for at some length. And she said, you know, you never know when a patient says they're at 10, she says, I've had patients say I'm 12 on a scale of 10 and 10 minutes later, they're fast asleep and they sleep all night. She says, it's entirely subjective. I don't know. I don't know you at all. I met you once a month ago. I don't know what's going on with you. Uh, she says, I gave you a laxative and I came back an hour later and I'm thinking maybe he's asleep but you were awake and said your pain was still way high. So I took your blood pressure and it was, it was 80 over 40. Now that's not good. BP is 120 over 60, right? That's where it ought to be. So, so I take your BP and it's 80 over 40 and that's not good. And I'm not sure what to do. So I called the charge nurse and I hate to, because we're short staffed tonight, but I called her in because I think maybe we need to pay attention to what's going on with you. And while we're looking at you, your BP suddenly drops to 60 over 30. Now, she says, in the nurse's squad room, we call that 60 over dead. Nobody comes back from a precipitous drop to 60 over 30. Uh, write him off. Call the gurney. She says, so I called for a rapid response. Now, I don't know if she ever had before. She didn't. I didn't get that part from her. A rapid response is an internal 911 call inside the hospital on her hospital cell phone. She dials a special code and literally in 60 seconds, the room is jammed with people sprinting down the hallways. We got a code here. Uh, we've got an EKG car. We've got technicians. We've got, we've got every nurse from the cancer unit. Uh, even though they're busy, we've got two ICU nurses who showed up. We've got the doctor who's on the wing and the chaplain shows up. Never a good sign <laughs> here. I've got the forms right here. <laughs> So, so they're all looking at me and, and in an attempt to lighten the mood, <laughs> this is awful of me. <laughs> you know, I'm an ebullient kind of guy. I look at Kristen, this, she's just pale as death, this 24 year old nurse. And I raise my hand and say, you did this to me. <laughs> and then suddenly everybody is very stone faced and they all turn and look at her. What'd you do to him? <laughs> Did you give him a pill? And she says, honest. They tell me he does this all the time. He's just kidding. He always says things like this. <laughs> anyway, it's probably career affecting for her, but she was still on board two months later. So I guess it was okay. So they took me. No, she didn't get fired. At least not for that. Yeah. She's great help. I love her. So, so they took me down to, um, to a uh, cardiac ICU because they have that particular wing has a relationship with cardiac ICU. Um, so that's where they took me. It could have been a different ICU. I don't know how that works, but they took me down there. And of course the experience of being transferred from the bed to the transport cart with all this chest full of broken glass, <laughs> you know, you know, they, they roll you over to one side, put a sheet under you, roll you back to the other side, pull the sheet through, roll you back on your back and then go clunk, 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 from one bed to the other to pull you across to the transport cart. And every time that happens, there's, there's this raspy pain in, in the abdomen. It's just, it's just un, unbearable, just unbelievable. What, what are you thinking about or how are you praying? Are you praying? Are you in too much pain to pray or? No, not really. What I'm thinking is, is this really stinks and I'm going to survive for the next 60 seconds. That's what I'm going to do right now. For 60 seconds, I'm going to endure this because I can. And when, and when I get there, actually, Ken, that's three breaths at a time. It's three deep breaths. <laughs> I counted them. <laughs> and when I get there, I'm going to do another 60 seconds. And when I get there, I'm going to do another 60 seconds. So that's what I was thinking. And that, that kind of of extend, extension lasted a couple of times when I was in the hospital. So they, they take me downstairs and, and some of this stuff is very disjointed to me in terms of what happens. I've got videotape in my head about it. Uh, lights going by on the ceiling very fast, feet moving, the rumble of the wheels on the cart, bumps on the expansion joints in the floor, pain, pain is pegged, but it has been for a long time. Uh, and, then, and then finally a strong male voice that says, can we get in there ahead of you? I don't think this one can wait. 
and I and I I don't know what that I mean I knew what that meant, but but I don't know where that occurred or when. Um, and when I'm and at some point during the night, I'm I'm laying there and and there is a nurse in my face who's shouting, "Kurt, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me!" And she is mad. She's angry. Uh, and there's somebody else, she's on my left side and on my right side, there's somebody else who's shaking me and they're slapping my face and they're, it's, it's very discomforting. Um, and it's very annoying. And I want to say, can, and I, t- and I finally verbalized to the nurse that I don't want to stay with you. Uh, she says, no, stay with me, stay with me. And she's angry about this. And the other one is moving me around. Well, it's a shake and shout. They're trying to keep me from slipping into unconsciousness. And Ken, there was a vision that I had that I described in the book. There's a vision that I had. This is not, I don't know if this is a near-death experience or not. I don't don't know anything about that. This is not a tunnel, but there is a white index card in my vision about, I don't know, four inches. It's a three by five card, three by five card. It's in my vision. And I'm looking at this card and the bottom right corner of this card is pulling me toward it. I'm in the center of the card and it wants me to slide off to the bottom right hand corner. The edges of the card are deteriorating like snow on a TV signal that's not working, right? And the the deterioration is creeping toward the inside of that card. But the bottom right corner, it's worse. It's coming up to the center and it wants to pull me down there. And down there is peace and quiet and calm and no hurt. And all I have to do is slide down to that bottom right-hand corner and things will get much better for me. And that nurse is shouting at me, no, stay with me, stay with me. And that tells me I've got to stay in the middle of that card. I can't let that stuff creep in on me. She says, she says, count, count backwards from eight or 10 or something. And so I grind out eight, seven, six, five, you know, and, and everyone, it's, my voice is gravel. It just hurts like the Dickens and four, three, two. And, and I, I count this way and she keeps shouting and this one keeps shaking me on the other side. Um, that was the nurse keeping me awake. My wife was on the other side with her in this room preparatory to the, to the splenectomy surgery. And, and Lynn knew what to do. She was shaking me and she was slapping me to keep me awake, to keep me conscious. Because if I'd lose, con- and then she, one of them told me, we lost you three times that night uh, into unconsciousness. Now, I don't know if the bottom right-hand corner of that card was unconsciousness or death. I don't know but it was imperative that I stay in the center of that. And I did not want to. And as I laid there contemplating that, I suddenly realized, you know, that bottom right-hand corner, that is absolutely a deadly place to go. I do not want to go down there. I, I want to, and yet I don't, because that is, that's a very serious thing. If I slide down there, it's very bad. It's very scary. And what was it that I'm, I'm, all, I'm interested in? Yeah. The, the, the will to, to fight and not let go at that moment, you know, <laughs> the, in your decision, you're, you know, they're slapping yeah. you around and, you know, there's something you have to be a fighter. You have to, cause <laughs> I, I think, I think that's the yeah. point that, you know, I, I saw it earlier. A lot of people just say, you know, you gave up or, you know, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. And this is not, this is not a fight that I chose, but it's the one that I have. So, so that's what I'm going to do because that message is coming to me. It's reliable. It's the word of God. It's scripture. I'm convinced in my heart that God has a message for me through that and many other passages, but this is the one he's given me and this is the fight. So this is what I'm going to do. And it may not work. Uh, It may, it may come to a bad end, but I will not come to a bad end because I'm going to stay on top of this thing and I'm going to fight it all the way to the bloody end. I said someplace and people object to this. I said someplace, you know, if you, if you die uh, over, over something like this, then at least die with, with a smile on your lips and defiance in your heart. (laughs) I am not going to go willingly into that darkness. I, I will. And I won't, I'll go willingly as God calls me home. But while we have life and breath, we will, we will fight to, to evidence the glory of God where we can in our own circumstance. And I, and I wanted, I wanted my, my posse to understand there is 
there is a manly way, there is a godly manly way to rise above the circumstances of your life and to deal with them rather than being rolled underneath the weight of those circumstances. And that's, that's what, that's what I came away with. Yeah. Wow. That's some powerful stuff. They found a little fusarium ball about the size of a marble. I think that was stuck to the side of the spleen when they took the spleen out. Oh, they wow. found a yeah. little ball of fusarium. That's what that was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, you know, the next thing was, you know, it looks like you had a catheter you got really friendly with a nurse <laughs> y'all bonded over this experience didn't you? <laughs> yeah yeah that was yeah that was a deal she is she has become one of my really good friends uh in fact she had her uh, <laughs> after after i got out of the hospital uh she has a uh a daughter who's three years old now so she had the daughter dedicated at our church um she had i had invited her to come to our church as i I had a little stack of business cards the pastor gave me and I handed them out to people. They got tired of me, but, uh, but I invited her, if you don't have a church home, come visit us. So she talked to me before I ever left the hospital. She talked to me and she says, do you guys, do you guys baptize my baby? And I said, well, yes and no. We don't actually baptize at our church um, for infants because there's some theological things about that, but we will certainly dedicate and I can explain it to you. And, and, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to do that. He says, well, okay. So, but she knew me. And, and so <laughs> over the catheter experience, <laughs> yeah, the doctor, that was earlier on. The doctor had said, uh, it said, let's see, what was the cavity he says, you have all this uh, fluid built up in your legs and we've got to get rid of that. And you could, you know, you could, you could flush it out. You could, you could urinate, you could, you could vacate it that way, but we're going to give you some medicine to make that happen, but you're going to be standing at the toilet for 24 hours. He says, that's not going to work. Uh, he says, so, so that's a non-starter. Uh, we could catheter, but because you don't have any white blood cells, you're at high risk. And if there's, it's a mechanical procedure, right? If there's any snag on the inside, then you could, you could bleed. There's no, well, there's no, there's no uh, platelets. The platelets are what stop the bleeding. There's no platelets. So if we snag on the inside, you'll bleed. And I said, for how long? And he just looked at me, he said, oh, I get it until I bleed out. That's how long. Um, he said, so, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to use the catheter. We're going to jam your body with 30,000 platelets, which is the maximum dose we can administer. So we give you 30,000 platelets. I said, yeah. And then you'll do a test to see if they took, and then you're going to do the catheter. He says, no, we're not there won't be time. Uh, this is immediate. We're going to administer the platelets and then immediately we're going to insert the catheter. He says the platelets will begin to die as soon as they're administered because that's too many and your body will not accept that many, but we're going to give them to you anyway. He says the hope is that enough will survive that if there is a problem, they will be able to do some good. <laughs> I said, well, that sounds risky. That's really, says, that's reassuring. Yeah. Yeah. He says you have AML. Everything is risky. <laughs> he says, so that's what we're going to try. I said, how will we know if there's been a problem? He said, if there is blood at the point of insertion, then that means that, we, that there's something that was snagged and it's not going to work. Uh, okay. So, so the nurse comes in and I noted, and this is the first time I'd really had contact with her. And she was the charge nurse uh, who was on duty. I normally didn't have a charge nurse taking care of me. The charge, you only got one on a shift, right? But this is the senior nurse. She's more experienced than anybody else. She's very competent. She's probably done thousands of catheter insertions in her life more than anybody else. They put the senior girl on this one uh, to go in here, and she and she performs this procedure, which produces some degree of anguish, I might say. For those of our male listeners who have never experienced this, you have this to look forward to. Just be a tough guy. <laughs> And get through with it, you know, and I scream at her, ah, I can't believe what you just did to me after we've been such good friends. <laughs> she says, I'm just, honey, I'm just doing what you need to have done for you. <laughs> and that really bonded us, uh, that experience. And she did well. There was no, there was no blood at the point of insertion. Everything was fine. And that, and that seemed to work, but it was just one more hurdle that we passed <laughs> in that long saga. Let's let's maybe take a brief detour here for a bit. You brought up yeah. your church, so I know yeah. you were with the United Methodist Church. <laughs> yeah, a I lot was. of things have gone on with the church. So, and, uh, I think you said that 
some of the anguish you experienced through that, trying to lead to maybe speak to that just briefly before we get back to some of your other issues here. Yeah. Yeah. We could, we could, yeah, they're both sort of train wrecks, but we could detour through that one. <laughs> so I, so, so, um, uh, my wife and I live in a small town outside Wichita, you know, a thousand people in town. And as a lot of small towns, we had a United Methodist church in town and she had been going to church there before we were married. She was teaching school out here. So we decided we'll go, we'll go to that church because a small church, maybe 40 people at that time, pastor. Um, and that was, we were married in, in 1983. And over the next 20 years, 15 years, we had noted a distinct leftward lurch in the political orientation of the church. Now, not the people in the rank you, and file. You've got a lot of discernment. People. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you hit me with a ball bat enough times, I can figure it out. <laughs> but so there, there are these top-down things that come from the bishop's office, and most of the time we don't circulate that stuff. But, but the top-down things, you know, write to your congressman and ask them to vote, to vote yes on the gun control thing. Uh, write to your congressman and ask him to vote yes on the free abortions thing. Write to your, you know, a guns and abortion. That's where most of the politics is in this country. So it's, it's, and there's a continual leftist message that began to come from the top down. Now, there are some extraordinarily good people in the rank and file of the United Methodist Church, and there still are uh, today. I have some really good friends, some lifelong friends there. Um, and, and I, and I respect their decision to stay where you are and do what you can do, but, you know, we always, as a congregation, we kept our head down as much as we could um, because we want we want a, a pastor who's solid, solidly biblical. Um, we have to use the right language. Who espouses a born again theology? Um, to we all know what that means, um, but we put it in that kind of mealy mouth language so we can communicate with that. Uh, it eventually got to the point where where we we could not stand the 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 top down here's the political agenda sort of thing that came to us. And when we had the opportunity to depart, uh, a couple of us had talked to our pastor as early as uh, 2018, the year 2018, about departing the church. And, and to the credit of the, of the United Methodist Bishop, who was over our church at the time, to his credit, when he did the annual alignment of pastors with churches, about 20% of the churches change pastors every year. So it's about a five-year stint, right? Uh, he aligned conservative pastors with conservative congregations, and he aligned more liberal pastors with more liberal congregations. And he did that to, to manage that conflict that he knew was brewing. And I think that was a stand-up thing for him to do. I, was, I had spoken with him on a couple of occasions. Uh, I really reject his personal political stance, but I really endorse what he did organizationally to make that, to make that work for us. So we wound up with a pastor uh, who, was, who had the same opinion about the, the, poli the political leaning of the congregation or of the denomination as we did. And I say we, at that time, we had maybe 150 people attending our church, and we were very homogeneous in terms of our agreement on, on most things, on virtually everything theological, the born-again theology, the Holy Spirit, the authority uh, of the scriptures, the authority of the scriptures, right, the in inerrancy and that sort of thing. So, so we, were, we were all very much aligned on that. Politically, we were all over the board like a lot of people are. I mean, some really good friends think that we should not have assault rifles available to people, whatever that might be. <laughs> the definition goes back and forth of what an assault weapon that is. It varies a lot in Texas. <laughs> varies a lot in Texas, yeah. And in Kansas, too, by the way. <laughs> there are a lot of people who just can't believe you're actually going to carry a gun concealed to church. Why would you ever do that? Uh, actually, it's to protect your daughter <laughs> if something untoward happens is what it's for. But never mind about that. Um so, so there, we have differences of opinions about those things. And even on the subject of, of LGBT and, and abortion, there are differences of opinion. We never talk about those differences. We'd rather talk about Jesus. We'd rather talk about the gospel. We talk about how we can reach people with a saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the rest of that is, is distraction. So let's focus on the gospel. And that's what, anyway, that's why I say we're pretty much together as a congregation on that. Uh, when the when the the general conference, the global church made the opportunity for us to depart and retain ownership of our property, which is what that's all about, who gets the building? 
Right. You know, we, we raised the money, we built a million dollar building, we're paying for it. And suddenly it's not ours. That that's a non-starter. You know, we, we get, we're going to take the building, you know, one way or the other, we're going to take the building. Um, so when we had the opportunity to legally depart that organizational system, um, we were scrupulous to follow exactly all the guidelines that they laid down. This is what we say you're going to have to do to be able to jump through those hoops. And we did them all. And it cost us money to do it. Um, so we, we had to raise the funds and we, we gracefully exited the United Methodist Church. And we didn't cause any problems. We didn't, you know, but we just have a difference of opinion about, about how we ought to live and move and have our being in these days. Yeah, I just wanted to share that. I, I know a lot of people in Texas are experiencing that in my hometown oh, yeah. here. Oh, yeah. They're split off. And, you know, in fact, I had a neighbor um, who's out in her front yard, and I could tell she just wanted to talk. And I, I walked over there, and yeah. and she was really torn up over the whole thing. And yeah. her comment was, uh, you know, Ken, I don't feel like, I'm leaving the Methodist church. I feel like the Methodist church left me. And this is a woman that's been there, you know, yeah, all her life, 65 Probably. years has yeah. faithfully tied, has faithfully right. uh, visited the sick, done, you know, all those uh, things you think of. Uh, and, you know, it was a big, I think she was like wanting my blessing. Right. Or, you know, I'm like, I, I agree with you, Bonnie. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that's really good insight on her part. She's, I think she's exactly right in that statement, Ken. She didn't leave the church. The church left her. I, I haven't moved. Um, you know, I still think the same thing that I, that I did earlier. So, yeah, that's, 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 that's a very mature perspective on her part. But I understand the heart-wrenching nature of that because she, she may be leaving good friends who have, who have different convictions. Yeah, who have different convictions about that. Yeah, it's tough to do. I the only thing I think is, is the sooner you get out of that, the better off it will be. Um, I'm, I'm very glad right now it's in our rear view mirror as, as our church. Um, and you know, we had some people who were bent out of shape and I think out of think out of what 75 families, I think we lost one family over that, uh, uh decision. I'd say that's about right with the ones that are yeah. experiencing it here. I've talked to yeah one of the pastors recently and, uh, Anyway, let's get you back in the back, back in pain and emergency room or ICU. So but we we finished that. We got we got over the night of the exploding spleen. Wow! And uh, I don't know. Did we cover the AFib or? Oh no, we haven't covered the AFib. Well, yeah, AFib. But, okay, but it's just a minor thing. Minor yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, the nurse comes in one night and says, uh, she, she recites the vitals to me, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, they take vitals over four hours. She recites the vitals, you know, your BP 120 over 75, uh, pulse rate is 135 and something else. Someone I said, wait, pulse rate is not 135. She says, well, that's what it says. I said, take it again. So she takes it again. Same thing. 130, 140, somewhere in there. I said, that's not right. She says, well, that's what it says. She says, okay, go, go to sleep. I'm going to check again in four hours. We'll see what it's like. Before we raise the red flag, we'll check it again. So she checks it again, and it's, and it's the same thing. And she didn't, now I think I was asleep. She didn't wake me up. She's just kind of keeping an eye on me. Well, the next night I go to bed, and it's the same thing again. You know, BP's fine. Uh, pulse rate's 128 or something like this. And I say, check that, check that manually. Feel it. And she couldn't get a pulse on my wrist. And I couldn't either. You know, boom, 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 You know, it's just very uneven. That's arrhythmia. I said that's that's wrong. Call the doctor and ask and ask him to come and see me. See what's because they got one twenty four hours. Ask what's wrong with that. So they decide that it's you know they get the cardiologist in. Next morning, I talk to the cardiologist. Says, yeah, it's atrial fibrillation that you've got. We can't let that go on because. Because eventually there'll go some, you'll have something that goes wrong. You'll, you'll get a clot in your heart or something and it will stop. That would be bad. So we need to fix that atrial fibrillation, right? <laughs> so, okay. How are we going to do that? And he says, well, we got a couple of different methods. For one, we're going to try this. For one, we're going to try that. For a, so mostly we're going to try drugs. We got this drug we're going to try for a few days. And then we got that drug if that doesn't work. I said, and if those don't work, he says, the, the last, the last chance is cardioversion. I said, what's, is that like a, 
Bible version? What, what, what is cardio version? Is that like New, New American Standard? He says, no, <laughs> he was from Syria. He didn't get it. Uh, he said, no, the cardio version is we administer an electric shock to the heart. I said, oh, so it's like a lobotomy. And he says, no, actually, we don't do those anymore. <laughs> That's what you may have read. <laughs> those kind of fell out of vogue about maybe 80 years ago. Um, we do an electric shock to the heart. He says, we don't like to do that because a lot of times it's not effective. Uh, a lot of times you got to administer it a couple of times. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's, and so he explained what that's about, you know, and there's, there's about electrical impulses that the heart generates and it generates an impulse someplace. And then it's repeated in, you know, the, from the, from the aorta to the ventricle or vice versa. The electrical impulse starts here and it's repeated there. So you get the lub dub, lub dub effect. And if that impulse is confused, then you get the lub, but a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a lub, but a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit. So you get that unevenness that happens. So, so the shock is just to say, I said, you're just going to hit it with a ball bat and make it straighten up. He says, that's what it amounts to. We're just going to smack it real hard and see if that makes it straighten up. Most of the time it does not, but we'll try it. He says, it is our last resort. We never like to use it. There is a chance, not that it's fatal, but that stroke will ensue. Sometimes it causes stroke. <laughs> I think, fine. You don't have a percentage, do you? <laughs> and he did of some kind. I was so fed up with percentages on things that may go wrong. I can't keep them all straight. Um, he says, so that's why we don't use it, because there is a, a serious risk of stroke. Well, you know, I don't want a stroke. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a healthy guy. My wife is an outdoors girl. She's a fly fisher. You know, she needs, she needs her travel freedom. She needs to be able to go out to a Colorado trout stream from time to time. She doesn't want to stay home and take care of this guy in bed. She did sign on for it 40 years ago. She signed on for it for, in sickness and in health, but I don't want to put her through that. So we try the medicine for a couple of days. And then I noticed we change up the regimen of medicine. Ha, first it didn't work, did it, doc? He says, well, we're still working with this. So we do this for a couple of days. And then he comes in and he says, We've decided that that cardioversion is probably our best course of treatment at this time. <laughs> I said, this is in spite of everything you just said a week ago, right? <laughs> he says, it is our best course of treatment at this time. And he recited, you know, he, he wouldn't meet my eyes. He looked out the window to recite all of the downside to this thing in a memorized spiel. You know, the risks are this, 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 and that, and maybe stroke. Uh, you know, the only thing we hear is, we're like that far side commercial where the guy talks to the dog in the, in the garage, ginger, you're doing wrong. You need to do this ginger. And all the dog hears is blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and all we hear the doctor say is blah, 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 stroke, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's all we hear. So they wheel me in to do the stroke. And, and the doctor was actually very nervous about this. I suspect he had not done this before, but he's a great guy and I like him, but I, but from the way he acted, I don't, I think he was inexperienced with that. And my wife picked up on that to put him at ease. He spoke with her and my brother was with her in the, in the, the family room before we went in for this and, and to put him at ease, she said to him, I just have one question for you, doc. He says, what's that? She says, can I be the one to push the button? <laughs> And his face just brightened up <laughs> and he said, I'm going to tell him you said that. <laughs> so, so we did this thing and, and, uh, anyway, there's that, that happened. There was a shock. I, I left thinking, you know, that should never be done to anybody <laughs> what they just did. But of course it's, it's part of the regimen. It's, it's part of what happens. And, and it's straight to the heart. The, uh, the next morning that cardiologist came in about, he always came early about 5.30 or 6 in the morning for his rounds, just the way the schedule came out. So he comes in the room, and and uh, he is grinning like a 14-year-old boy who is just with, with a new pony. <laughs> he is grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> I said, you must be pretty proud of yourself today, aren't you? And he said, well, it worked. You know, what can I say? It worked. But he was very relieved over that thing. And what day was this? How, how many days uh, approximately? You know, I think, see, that would have been after the, uh, the, the, the spleen was day 34. This was probably day 50 or 60, something like that. I think, you know, we're probably two thirds of the way through, but, and most of the rest of that is, is denouement. You know, most of the rest of that is, mm -hmm. you know, various things happen and, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, the next most... thing was, you know, your kidneys are shutting down on you. <laughs> Everything you've been through, I mean, whatever, <laughs> Actually, you know, no, no, no big happen. deal there. I mean, you know, that's, you die, Yeah, no big but, thing. Uh, what do you need those for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I cut up, yeah. Uh, actually, that one we we probably need to talk about. That's probably the last big piece in this thing. But but uh, that was right after the splenectomy. Uh, you know, Lynn puts out on Curing Bridge this urgent request for prayer. Please pray because he's got the the spleen. We got to do the emergency splenectomy. Um, you know, BP is low. Whatever this is, and then we have the surgery at something like nine o'clock in the morning or ten in the morning, the night after this thing sets in. They do the emergency surgery. And that should be that, but an hour after that surgery, the kidneys shut down. Now the kidneys shut down because the blood pressure had dropped so precipitously the night before. Uh, this is like the laterals in your septic tank out in your yard. Uh, the laterals have stuff going through them out into the, to the septic tank, right? If you, if you quit putting water pressure through those things, they're made a pipe and they'll stay open. The filters in the bladder around the whole around the uh, the kidney sorry around the kidney and that whole perimeter around the kidney there are about a million of these little filters nephrons they call them and they're not made out of pvc pipe <laughs> they're made out of tissue and if there's no blood pressure those will close up and as soon as they close up they are not going to reopen uh you can put pressure against them but it's just a blockage at that point so if the nephrons quit which means the kidneys quit then if they stay in that condition for not very long, a couple of hours, maybe they will never reopen. And then the trash backs up and impurities get back into the system. And then you die from whatever infection that is. Uh, and that's what a dialysis machine is for is to push that is to push the blood pressure through those things in part and keep those things open. So the kidneys quit working and they had a dialysis machine that they applied and that machine malfunctioned, it wouldn't work. Okay, they have backup machines. They pull that one out, and I remember hearing the machine, the big klaxon, sound like a submarine about to dive, dive. The klaxon goes off beside the bed. And you know, I was fully intubated, and I was trying to tell the technician, just call the manufacturer's rep. There's always a manufacturer's rep. He'll know what's wrong with it, but I couldn't speak. I didn't know I was intubated, had the tube in. And then I thought they probably don't want my advice anyway. So they work on this thing. They bring in a second dialysis machine and maybe it works. I was unconscious through most of this or drugged or something. I was not aware of what was going on except that dad gum machine. The, uh, the uh, kidney doctor, the nephrologist called my wife out of, the, out of the ICU ward at that time. And this has only been six or eight hours after the splenectomy and we're supposed to be good now calls her out and she says, the kidneys are not working. Uh, the drugs that are supposed to make the kidneys work have not taken effect. We've had some trouble with the dialysis machine. And I will tell you, if the kidneys do not start on their own very soon, we are at the end. Uh, you need to prepare yourself for this because this is not going to end well. Uh, he will pass uh, in a very short period of time today if those kidneys don't start working. Now, we're going to try drugs. We're going to try a different machine. We're going to do what we can do, but you need to prepare yourself for that. And Lynn's thinking, how do you prepare for that exactly? I mean, I've sort of been prepared, but now what? And, and, I, and I don't know the chronology exactly. While they're there, Marva, the house cleaner, shows up with her push cart. <laughs> Marva shows up and and she says, Miss Lynn, what you doing here? Thought you folks would be long gone by now, back home again. And Lynn explains to her about the kidneys. Well, let's go pray for them kidneys. So Marva comes into the room and my brother's there and his wife, another friend of the family, and Lynn's there. And there's a nurse in there with her back to us. So she's working on a machine, I'm told. Marva does another one of her prayers. Oh, Lord Jesus, you made this man's kidneys. So she does this. And this goes on for five minutes. You know, and everybody's got their hands up and they're all crying and she's praying and she finishes this stuff. And I'm just laying there, you know, with my with my tube and not only think about it. And Marva leaves the room and the nurse turns, whirls on the family and says, what was that? <laughs> she had never seen anything like that before. And Lynn says, that was Marva. She's the housekeeper. She says, who is she with? Well, she's actually with you guys. She's on the cleaning staff. <laughs> Is she a chaplain? Well, 
no, actually, she's not. She's a house cleaner. Like I said, you can tell by the scrub she's wearing. <laughs> so the nurse was quite taken with that. And, and in some period of time, I don't know if it was minutes, seconds, an hour, half a day, the kidneys started working. Those nephrons opened up and the blood pressure came back and the kidneys started working again. So drugs, dialysis, prayer, I don't know. As I say, it's not a lab experiment, it's real life. But there were, I'm going with prayer. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going with prayer because anyway, that's, that's part of why Marva has become such a close friend. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Like uh, I, I spent 30 days in the hospital. Yeah, and, I knew um, you had. The, uh, the attitudes, like, you know, you're talking about Marva and different people like that. And I had different people come in and go on of course and but i had this yeah. one doctor and my wife and i my nickname for him was dr death <laughs> i mean it was like <laughs> doom and gloom you know really i so mean it was, it, it was his, his attitude to it right? and then to the other extreme i call this other doctor he, you know it was almost uh he looked at her like she was like uncouth or not really civilized or sophisticated. <laughs> I called her my cheerleader <laughs> and she would come in the room and just, yeah, you know, Mr. Ken, you're, you're doing so good, man. You know, we're so I, proud I, of you. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta keep eating, you know, you gotta get your strength back and, and all this. And, and, uh, I looked forward so oh, yeah. much every day just for her to come in oh yeah and yeah. give me that word of encouragement yeah that encouragement is so valuable kim it, it's it it's so valuable and that's that's what i meant by the attitude war you know you lose the attitude war you lose the war that uh it's interesting your experience that with the doctors you came through that okay i presume you're here yeah um, yeah yeah i yeah. uh i rallied and uh you know i had four doctors give me up for dead Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they called my brother, uh, said, you know, if you want to see Ken again, you need to come down here. He's yeah. going to be with us in the morning. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was something, uh, I wrote a book about it too. You know, I couldn't, uh, yeah, I, I had a, uh, a Jacob to Israel experience. I, I knew that mm -hmm. night when they rolled me down into the, the hall, I knew that if I went to sleep, that I wouldn't, I was going to die. That's the much like, much like my three by five card in my, in my vision that night, if I slide down there, it'll be very peaceful, but it's going to be at the end. So, you know, this is 10 30 at night. I'm weak. I can't breathe. Yeah. Uh, I've gone from going out to my ranch and tossing around 60 pound bags of concrete. Right. You know, a week earlier to now, I can't even pick up a fork to feed myself. Right. Yeah, I know what that's like. But, but I knew, I knew. And so thank God I, like you, I've had a lot of the scripture and I just stayed up all night and just groaned in the spirit Yeah, and just prayed and every, every verse I've ever memorized or thought mm -hmm. about how the, the Holy Spirit would bring different scriptures to, to my mind. And it's good to be grounded in the word and it's good to have that. But, you know, the encouragement thing, one thing that I don't know if you noticed this, but one thing that, that I found with my Caring Bridge posse was that those people were praying for me. And, of course, Marva was. Those people were praying every day. I'd send them out something. Now, I did miss two days when I was in ICU. My, my brother sent that out for me instead. But it was always optimistic, upbeat, uh, engaging they wanted to read it they wanted to say what what clever thing is he going to say today which is why i did that it's sort of manipulative but they thought they thought they were going to have a win they thought i was going to walk out under my own power <laughs> and and after a while i realized i can't let them down i've got to stay in this because what's their experience going to be we prayed for that old boy who has been a leader in our church. He's instrumental in the, we talked about the separation from the denomination. He's, he's, he's very, he's not, he's not ordained, but he's very much a pastor figure to us, you know, as, as a leader and has been for years. Uh, we prayed for him. We did everything we're supposed to do. We claimed the promises of God and we lost him. 
what's what's that going to do to them about about their about their convictions about prayer now whatever the theology of that is right wrong or otherwise i thought those people deserve a win they they deserve seeing me come back and come to church with them again and be in the pulpit again to fill in for the pastor so that really that really cranked it up for me i i need i need to buckle down and make sure this thing works uh, whatever that means. And it's just attitudinal, but, but I just need to assume I'm, I'm going to have a win here. I'm going to walk out under my own power one of these days. And it was hugely encouraging to me uh, and turned some pressure on me for that, which I think was very positive. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I heard code blue left and right yeah. people, Yeah, you know, the, the Psalms, you know, uh, what is it? A thousand to die at my right hand and 10,000 right. will not come near me. That scripture in I think Psalm 90 and, uh, 90 and 91, uh, yeah. I felt the same way with the nurses. I, you know, I, I, uh, I was like, wow, they're, they're just so overwhelmed. All they see is death. It was like, there was a spirit of right. death on the, on the sixth floor of the hospital. Yeah. And, and, um, they, I felt like they needed a win too. Yeah. Yeah, they, they need it. They've got to be up all the time. Yeah. One of those uh, nurses that uh, Kristen, who was with me on during the spleen incident, uh, when we debriefed a couple months after that, before I left the hospital, she said, uh, I asked her, do you like working in oncology or would you rather be someplace else in the hospital? She said, she said, I much prefer being here in oncology because she says, now she's 24 years old. All you guys are older right you're all old people and you get cancer <laughs> yeah so you're all and so, so maybe it's the maturity that comes from from living through circumstances in your life but everybody here with cancer has been caught by surprise nobody expects cancer now i suppose lung cancer could be an outlier from that if, if you've been a smoker but she says nobody who has cancer uh thinks that it's going to happen but on the lower floors of the hospital almost everything is self-inflicted <laughs> it's through drugs or alcohol or doing something stupid in a car or or beating somebody up and getting beat up in return uh, that's what happens down there and they take it out on the nurses you know there, there are people who who feel bad and they feel guilty and they're bitter about it and they get mad at us but up here on, in, in the cancer unit, you guys, you guys see the cancer not as a problem to complain about, but rather as a situation that just needs to be solved. So let's just figure out what the solution is and go through it. It's a much more mature uh, climate we've got up here, and it's much more relaxing for the nurses. And you guys really never take it out on us. I said, well, give me time. I'll think of something that's probably your fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a great. So you, you kind of close out. Uh the book which man folks y'all this is i'm gonna talk to kurt here in a little bit about send me a dozen of these so i can give them to some pastors and put it take them give them to the cancer place yeah. here in texas uh, but you have some lessons that you've learned i think you have like eight different ones uh yeah let me go over let's see if we can't walk through a few of those okay uh the first one you you mentioned is optimism and we kind of covered some of it. it's it's yeah infectious whether it's genuine or not, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it it is infectious. Uh, when I when I started the Caring Bridge thing, and I'm and I'm I've got this upbeat attitude. That's when they start to expect a win. They think, oh well, this is going to be okay. Look, he's making a joke about it, so I'm going to be optimistic too. So when they pray, they're praying in such a way that I expect I expect yes for an answer to this. So I think it, it, it influences a lot of that stuff. And there's no, there's no down in the dumps. There's no, oh, can you believe it? It's so bad. He's going to die. You know, we, we've been around things like that before. It's not good. Uh, but yeah, it's infectious. And that's why I wanted to imbue that, that attitude among them. And the next one, encouragement incentivizes success. Yeah, that's the one I've talked about where once, once, they, once they started to encourage me, uh, and everything that they said encouraged me. And actually, for your people who are listening to this thing, if you're if you're on Caring Bridge or if you know somebody who's in the hospital, send them a brief note. Don't pontificate and don't give them your theology, but just send them a brief note uh, to be encouraging. It just tells me somebody's out there and they are aware of what's going on, and that that encourages me to say I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna suck it up and do everything I can uh, to make this thing work. Uh, to be healthy again. We can't control a lot of this stuff, but some of it we control. 
Some of we can't because it's attitudinal. And one of the things I did too, Kurt, when I was there, uh, I uh, had my wife, I ordered food for the whole nursing staff. Really? Three <laughs> different times. Maybe it was four times. Good for I you. I wanted them to know. Number one, I wanted them to know I really appreciated it. You know, so they weren't, some of them weren't, I mean, the majority of them weren't in my nurses. Right. Uh, okay. And they were like, you know, it's during the COVID craziness and all. Yeah. they would open my little glass door and say, well, thank you so much. <laughs> if you hadn't uh, had that food brought in a day, I wasn't going to eat. Right. You know, we're just so overwhelmed. We've got yeah. too many patients. Uh, you know, the whole thing with uh, right. the nurses, uh, right. well, they call them uh, travel nurses, I guess. Uh, I yeah. Think another yeah. Word for I you're getting three times as much pay they can go to right go this and so sure you know, all that was going on underneath too yeah they're short term yeah i had several of those yeah they're short term yeah that's uh that's that's cool you did that my wife brought in uh, carbohydrates every day she stopped it <laughs> we spent a fortune on donuts yeah <laughs> for yeah. the nurses you know and at one point one of the one of the one of the girls who is a uh she's not a nurse but she's a clerk at the at the at the station she says you know, Lynn was late to, to come in that day. She says, is Lynn going to be here soon? I had to eat an apple for breakfast. How soon is she coming in? <laughs> One of them bear claws. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we've got, oh, there's several more there, folks, but uh, I, let's kind of shift a little bit here. We won't go all yeah. those, uh, but the, the cover of the book I found really interesting. Uh, the alligator and alligator wrestling. Uh, how'd you come up with this? Uh, <laughs> I think early in the book, I, I say, I've never wrestled an alligator. Uh, closest I've been to one is at the Denver Zoo. Uh, in fact, I've never even noodled for catfish, but I know people who know people who have. <laughs> so maybe that qualifies me. <laughs> I thought you were a tough guy, Kurt. Come on. <laughs> you haven't wrestled alligators? <laughs> you know, Paul, Paul says, I, I fought with wild beasts. At That's what he says. I fought with wild beasts. I've been snake bit. You know, look at me. <laughs> Uh, it is, uh, in, in my mind, that metaphor, it is, it is unplanned, unscheduled, untimely, unlikely to end well. <laughs> we don't know what the alligator wrestling is like, but I can imagine that I'm in this murky, dark green water wrestling with an alligator longer than I am tall, trying to keep away from the teeth. And that, that was sort of my experience with this, uh, with this acute myeloid leukemia. There is some really big, bad, ugly problem here. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm being forced into wrestling it, and I did not expect it, and I don't think I'm going to survive it, but but I'm going to give it a try. We're going to see what this is like, and I don't have any choice in it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you know, I, I found a guy who's a an artist. He's a book publisher in uh, Boston. I found him online in a resource, and uh, he has done uh, he's done illustrations. I wanted a cartoon illustration. He's done illustrations for Nav Press for Christianity Today. Yeah, he's done some C.S. Lewis stuff, some Tolkien work. So, and I wanted a Christian uh, just so I didn't have to explain everything to him, but I, I, I chatted with him. We didn't talk, but I chatted with him on the, the virtual facility and explained, I want, I want the big Luke, leukemia, the big Luke, the alligator. I want him to be standing up. He's the cock of the walk. He's, he's very, very haughty. He thinks he's completely invincible, but I want him to be not invulnerable he has weak spots that he's not aware of i want him to, i want him to be a really tough guy but there's some weakness and so and so casey draws a butterfly sitting on top of the ivy tree <laughs> and there are these little gnats kind of buzzing around the alligator who looks so haughty and and so and so confident uh and i thought he captured that real well and i, I actually i wanted to cover the book that would that would i want the i want the uh, the thumbnail to pop out um, we all buy books by their covers on Amazon, you know, so when you go there, you want one that's, that you're going to say, oh, what is that? And then click on it. So I thought he did real well with the cover of that. Uh, leave us with a word, Kurt, um, about, you know, how can we minister to people uh, that are experiencing just tragic situations, yeah. whether it's leukemia or COVID yeah. or cancer, What you know. Well, the death, the death of a child, the death of a spouse, uh, divorce, loss of career, you know, any of those things. Um, 
Well, you know, what I keep coming back to, Ken, is that it's, it's lesson number eight in the book. We do not always get to choose the trials we face, only how we face them. Uh, you didn't ask for this, probably. And if you did, you shouldn't have, but here it is anyway. And you've got it to deal with. And at this point, you don't have any choice on whether you're going to deal with it. The only choice you have is how you're going to respond to it. Um, I put up I put a war story in every chapter in the book, mostly to attract the male readership who would never read a book about a guy with cancer. <laughs> right. But most of those are from my dad's experience, U.S. Navy World War II. And he and one thing he describes is the Navy chief that he that he met. And I won't belabor you with this, but the Navy chief he met who was at uh, the Marine invasion of Tarawa, Tarawa, the first full scale Marine invasion of the war, like 1943. And the chief that my dad was talking to had a scar down the side of his head. Um, what had happened was the landing craft with the Marines got hung up on a barrier reef 500 yards offshore, and they were all hung up there. Uh, and the, the captain on the destroyer where the chief was serving said, I want a, a bosun's mate and a chief in both of our motor launches and go in there and get those Marines and either take them to shore or bring them back here, but get them out of there. And this chief jumps into a boat with a sailor and they power into this and they've got 40 Marines in a landing craft and they get them over the gunnel of the landing craft into their wooden boat with packs and weapons. There's sodden, there's, there's artillery all around them. There's machine gun fire that's raking. The Japanese know perfectly well where that barrier reef is. And, and the chief and the bosun's mate, they took those guys on the shore and they go back and forth all morning doing that under fire. Dad says, so where's your tin hat? How can we get the bullet? He says, my tin hat, it's below, it's below decks in my quarters, of course. We're five miles offshore. What would I possibly need a helmet for? <laughs> and you think about that, that sailor, those two sailors with those Marines. Um, very poignantly, we do not always get to choose the trials we face, only how we face them. You know, I can, I can do what I need to do and get those guys into shore because the sooner we get this thing over with, the sooner we can all go home. Or I can turn tail and run back to the destroyer and say, I couldn't make it. It was too hard. We just get to choose how we're going to face the trial. Yeah, that's good. Well, I appreciate I appreciate your uh, time, your encouragement. I appreciate you uh, writing this book. And uh, I'm sure our listeners are going to love uh, this episode. So, uh, man, thanks so much, Kurt. I write a blog, uh, alligatorpublishing.com, alligatorpublishing.com. Uh, I put out a newsletter about three times a week, so it's subscribed for free uh, for, for pearls of wisdom that drop off his tongue. <laughs> oh, yes. yes <laughs> or some yes. snarky humor and see what it's like. <laughs> An inspiration galore. Yeah, we'll put that link in as well. Irreverent humor is what we is what, is what we call that. <laughs> Thanks, Ken, very much. I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks for the ability to share this message with your people.